Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Holford, and I'm the Family Ministries Director of the Trans European Division. I have a background in psychology, and I'm also a family therapist. And so that's what helped me to discover some of these things that I'm going to share with you this morning. But the most important thing is that when I learned about them, I actually tried them out in my own life, and they made a huge difference to me and my positive attitude to life. And so I hope that you'll find something here, just one thing that you can do that will help you with your mental health and well-being, and perhaps help you to help others as well. So I'm going to be talking about balancing our emotions in an unbalanced world. Because we live in an unbalanced world and we're always going to have negative and positive emotions. And a lot of the time, things are thrown at us. They happen and we just respond to them the best way we can. What I've discovered is that the Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that we can actually choose what we focus on and choose to focus on many of the good things that God has put into the world for us to experience and how they help our well-being. So if we go back and think about Paul, he wrote Philippians when he was in jail. He was actually awaiting execution, which is not a great place to be when you think about it, of all the places in the world. Um, to feel positive and joyful. This is not where most people would engage with those emotions. But his letter to his friends in Philippi is just filled with joy. It's just overflowing. It's exuberant. So Paul has a very positive approach to life. He says in uh, Philippians 4, chapter 4, where most of his good wisdom is shared, praise God and be happy that he loves you. Give your worries to God. Let him take care of them. Fill yourself with the peace of God by looking at nature with wonder, remembering all that God has done for you. Be kind to others, be gentle with them and focus your thoughts on positive things. So these are the, some of the things that we can glean from Paul's writings and especially from Philippians chapter four. Before we talk about balancing emotions, we need to think about what emotions are really. Well, they're actually invitations for us to connect with others. Romans 12, 15 says, be happy with those who are happy. So when someone's happy, connect with them in happiness. When someone's sad, connect with them in their sadness. They're there to help us connect, relate, show empathy, understand each other. Emotions are also our natural responses to living in a world that has chaos and pain, as well as beauty, love, and joy. And emotions are informational signals. They're from our, they come from our body to help us respond appropriately to our experiences, to our challenges and to our joys. And a lot of the ideas that I'm going to share are from a book called Positivity by Barbara Fredrickson, who researched health psychology. She said, so many psychologists are focused on what goes wrong. I want to focus on what goes right, what happens when we function well. We need to know about that. And I believe this is what God wants us to understand, how to function well in an unbalanced world. So when I talk about negative emotions, they're not bad emotions. They are the feelings that drain us. And conversely, positive feelings are the ones that fill us up and help us to flourish. And our emotions in themselves, they're not good or evil. They, they just are. It's our body responding chemically and neurologically to the things that are happening around us. And we can choose how do we respond to our feelings, even when we're in difficult circumstances. And this was Paul's secret. He was in a difficult place. He could just have been miserable there, but he chose to respond to his feelings in positive ways. I'm not gonna think about where I am. I'm going to focus on God, on praising him, on the positive things around me, on being kind to others, experiencing peace, praying and giving God all my worries. And those were some of the things that that he did and that, and that we can learn about today. So our emotions are not shameful. They're natural responses to life experience. Jesus experienced negative and positive emotions. He was sad, he was happy, he uh, experienced peace, he experienced all sorts of different emotions. And it's, we should not dismiss anyone's feelings, say, oh, you shouldn't feel like that or shame them for having negative feelings. We feel like that, feelings are, and by shaming people, we just actually make them feel worse and add to their difficulties. So I'm going to talk about emotional balance. That's what helps us have good well-being, good mental health 
is when we can um, manage this balance in our life. And it can be a tricky thing to balance, but it's possible. There are things we can do to help us balance. Psychologists used to think that um, healthy and happy emotions, they were just the icing on the cake. You went through life and if you had some positive experience, well, that was wonderful. But now we know that positive experiences in life will help us to flourish. They are the important bits of life that help us to have the abundant life that Jesus wanted us to have. He said, I come that you might have life and to have it more abundantly. And that's what the positive emotions are about. They're experiencing life abundantly. Positive emotions broaden our minds. They help us to think differently about things and wisely about things. They help us to recover from stressful situations. So if we do have a difficult time, choosing those positive emotions as Paul did can help us rebalance and recover and find some peace and equilibrium again. Positive emotions help us to build resilience as well. The more of them we experience, the more resilient we are when life is challenging. And positive emotions help us to be loving to other people and to be lovable people. And because the positivity bubbles out of us, even in difficult times. When we think about emotional balance, most people actually have a two to one ratio of positive to negative emotions. And when I heard that, I thought, well, that's pretty good. I mean, to feel happiness or joy or peace or love twice as many times as negative emotions like anger and fear and sadness and frustration, that seems pretty good. But the research shows that we have better emotional health when the ratio is at least three to one. That's like the baseline. And, and if you go to positivityratio.com, there's a way of actually measuring your emotional balance every day. It looks at the positive and negative emotions and how much you experienced of each of them in a day to work out your balance. We do even better. We begin to flourish more when the balance is four to one or five to one. But if it gets too high, we can lose touch with reality. And that's also not very helpful. That becomes an imbalance in another way. So what are some of the negative emotions that prevent us from living happy, hopeful, loved and satisfied lives? I'm sure most of us know what they are, and we've experienced some of these in the past week, I'm sure. There's anger, contempt, disgust, embarrassment, fear, frustration, guilt, sadness, shame, and stress. Of course, there's many more than these, but these are the most common, most frequent ones that we experience as human beings, and I will unpack them a bit more. So some negative emotions are just a normal, healthy response to a sad or challenging situation. If you lose something, you lose a job, if your, your health deteriorates, if you lose a loved one, you're going to feel sad. I mean, that's just, that's normal. It's a normal, healthy response. And we feel that when something that we love is, is taken away from us, the oxytocin levels in our body can drop and it can feel like a chemical withdrawal from something that's been making us feel happy and loved. And that's why loss can feel so utterly painful and heartbreaking. Other negative emotions can drag us down into despair and we can feel hopeless or too sad. <clears throat> so we need to balance them. So anger, anger is feeling displeasure, hostility or antagonism towards someone or something. And we can help people with their anger by listening calmly, showing that we understand that we want to understand and helping people to look for win-win solutions to their challenges. Contempt is feeling very disrespectful towards someone or something and having this bitter sense of superiority. And that's really actually very unhealthy for us. The, the science shows that contempt is one of the most um, unhealth, unhealthy emotions that humans can feel. And it really hurts them in uh, their body, their mind. So look for strengths in others, show people respect and compassion. And remember that we're all beloved children made in his image. Um, no one should experience contempt from anyone else. Disgust is being revolted by something or someone that sounds, smells, looks, or tastes is really horrible. And disgust is there to help us stay away from potential toxins and dangers. So we're not going to eat something that, that looks revolting or smells revolting. And that's uh, to keep us safe. And there's embarrassment, that feeling of shame when something you did wrongly or badly is made public. Oh, it's just so mortifying. And we need to comfort and support people who have been embarrassed. Don't add to their shame on social media or by the way you talk to them. Build them up kindly, 
talk about the times when they did something well, do something to make them feel special, help them to remember that their whole life is more than just this one embarrassing moment. Fear is a feeling of anxiety about a real, possible or probable situation that you feel unable to handle well. Our fears are often based on traumatic past experiences. And it's very important not to shame or tease people because of their fears. They've often started very early on in childhood and the body just naturally remembers those fears and just says, be careful, be careful and can make them feel very afraid. And it's important to help people to feel safe. Perfect love casts out fear. My husband knows that I have a fear of, of, of precipices and cliffs and being in high places that developed from when I was a young child. And he's learned to be very caring and helpful and protective when I'm in those sorts of situations to help me feel safe and reduce my fear. Um, I still have some fear, but I feel safe because I know he's there to help me and support me. Frustration is feeling irritated when it takes you longer to reach your goals than you expected, or that awful time when you've really done your best and someone comes along and criticized you. So when we're frustrated, it's good to take a deep breath and pause, relax, let our minds find some balance, look for alternative solutions to the problem, ask someone for help. This is what frustration stimulates, the, the connection through looking for help and ideas to support us. Guilt is feeling remorseful, sad or responsible when we think we've done something wrong or we've hurt somebody. And it's really important we know now, the science shows to put things right quickly on the same day if possible. Apologize or do something kind for the other person. Help repair what, what was broken. If you leave um, an, un, an unforgiven, unresolved like, situation between people to another day and you both sleep on it, Something about sleeping on the situation does actually make it worse, make you feel more anxious and more depressed about it. So that's why it's really important to resolve um, things and ask for forgiveness or put things right as soon as you can. Sadness is feeling a sense of loss or disadvantage, feeling helpless, alone, misunderstood. And when someone's sad, we need to be with them, to listen, to comfort to be sad with them, sometimes just to sit there and cry with them. Don't shame people who are sad and say, oh, big boys don't cry. We actually need to comfort boys when they cry so they learn to comfort others. Otherwise, we make it harder for them to feel compassion for others and make it easier for them to be violent. So we need to be very careful how we respond to boys' sadness. Don't shame people who are sad or ignore them or make them feel sadder. Just be there and be comforting. Shame is feeling inadequate or guilty, usually because others have made us feel inadequate. It's often not from something we've done. Other people have said shaming things to us or done shameful things to us. We need to cherish and honor others, to lift them up, as Paul says in Romans 12, honor them above ourselves, bless them like Jesus did. If others try to shame them, Remind them of their value in your eyes and God's eyes. Help them to see themselves as valuable. Stress is feeling that you're being asked to do more than you can manage. And maybe if you don't work hard enough, you'll be seen as a failure. So you can help yourself by organizing your workload, making clear plans, reducing your stress, cutting out um, things you don't need to do uh, so you can focus and flourish. Again, we can ask for help when we're stressed and learn how to say no kindly if you're asked to do more than you can comfortably manage. Take care of yourself. Be compassionate towards yourself. Well, those are some of the top 10 most commonly experienced negative emotions, but the good news is that life is not all about negative emotions. We have healthy and happy emotions. And what are the top 10 positive emotions that actually help us to flourish? They are fun and laughter, gratitude, inspiration, joy, serenity, hope, interest. I'll explain that one. Feeling valued, experiencing awe and wonder and love. These are the top 10 most common positive emotions. And when we experience those, we help to rebalance. So the negative emotions can put us into like a negative balance and a bank account. And the positive ones can rebalance this up. Remember that we also need to have at least three to one positive to negative emotions. So we need to choose more actively 
to experience and engage in positive emotions. And I tried this out in my life and I found that it really does make a difference. So if I'm having a, a challenging day, I've had some stress and frustration, some other things happening to me. Uh, on the way home from work or in the evening, I will pause and I will um, intentionally experience positive emotions like these. So amusement and laughter is laughing and smiling at something unexpected, unusual and safe, laughing with others and not at others because a cheerful heart is a good medicine. That's a really good medicine to, to rebalance your thinking in your life. So you can, we used to laugh around the table when we came home together with the children. We'd always share the funniest thing that happened to us or something funny that we'd heard. So you can describe something funny that happened to you um, share your funny stories from the day, watch a funny movie or a YouTube clip, share a funny picture or joke on your phone, positive phone, and tell each other what makes you laugh the most. When we have a really good belly laugh, it can really help us. When I was a child, my family used to have tickle fights a lot, and that tickling laughter used to help us, um, I don't know, just engage, connect, relax together, and that was part of the amusement and laughter. Awe and wonder, and I love this one because we can do this wherever we are. Even if I'm in a room with no windows, my hand can fill me with wonder. And when we have a sense of wonder about something beautiful in nature that God has made, then our hearts are, are lifted up. You know, when you look at the stars or see a rainbow or you see an amazing flower or you, you watch a wild animal or hear a bird song, you know, our, our hearts can be filled with joy. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Be filled with awe and wonder for all that God has made and all that he is. So we can slow down and really look at the wonders of nature around us. We can look at the stars, the sky, be amazed at our own hands, the way our own bodies work. It is incredible what God has done. Look for the details you've not noticed before. So many times we just walk past things. We don't stop to look, even at animals in a zoo. People only look at the most amazing animals for maybe 30 seconds and then they move on. We don't stop and look at them and watch them and learn about them and notice the details we've not seen before. Um, look at all these beautiful petals and their, their delicate edges and how they've all curled together. Notice that and say, God made that to bring me joy, let me rejoice in it. And linked to awe and wonder, when we experience those wonder moments, they often inspire gratitude and thankfulness. So gratitude is an appreciation of something or someone who makes our life better or more comfortable or more enjoyable. And Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. And that can be challenging. But I've learned in my life that when something super challenging has happened, I can stop and I can look and I can actually find something good, something to be thankful for in every circumstance. And, and God has, God is doing amazing things around us and we need to be noticed what, what they are and be thankful to him for all that he has done, all that he's given us, all that he is sharing with us every single day. So you can name something you're thankful for, beginning with each letter of the alphabet or each letter of your name. We used to do this in our family, um, go through the alphabet and say, thank you, God, for things that begin with A and then B. Or you can start a gratitude diary. And Bernie and I did this when we were first married. And every day we would write three things we wanted to thank God for. This was 37 years ago, long before people were talking about gratitude diaries. Or walk along the street, thanking God for one thing after another, the birdsong, the tree, that person walking down the road, the fresh air, the sunshine, whatever it is, just keep thanking one thing after another. Hope is the belief that things can and will change and improve. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and not be faint. When we hope in the Lord, it lifts us up. And uh, we can hold on to the hope that he shares with us. So what gives you hope when life is challenging? What are you looking forward to right now? What are you looking forward to in the future? And when we think about the things that we're looking forward to spiritually or in our relationships or whatever, then that can lift our hearts again and help us experience positive emotions that help to protect our mental well-being. 
and emotional well-being. So hope is making sure that you always have something to look forward to with your friends and family. And I think that that is one of the reasons God gave us Sabbath, because it was never very far away. You could look forward to Sabbath, its peacefulness, its, its beauty, its the, all the gifts that are in the Sabbath. Every week there is something to look forward to with hope. We can plan fun times, celebrations and treats with family and friends. And again, I think that's why God put so many celebrations and feasts into the Jewish um, calendar. So they would be having something to look forward to and celebrate very often. Look out for people around you who might be discouraged and lonely and give them things to look forward to, to give them hope as well. Inspiration also lifts us up. So when we do something or read something or watch something inspiring, that helps to rebalance our emotions. Being inspired by God or spiritual insights, listening to a good sermon, a good devotional, reading some books, recognizing excellence even in another person, saying thank you, God, for what the, the gift you have put into that person. They're so inspiring. Right now, people have been watching the Olympics and the way that those people move and the strength that they have and the power that they have that can inspire us and we can recognize excellence in them and go wow and thank God for what he's done in, in people as well as in the world around us and Paul said in Philippians for whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely or admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy this is what you should think about don't look at the conspiracy theories, the bad news, the awful things. Fill your mind with the things that are pure and lovely and right. If you find yourself focusing and ruminating on something negative, stop that thinking, shift your mind over and focus on something positive like wonder or gratitude or love or hope or something or pray or focus on a, a favorite Bible verse like be still and know that I am God and do something that moves your mind away from the negativity. <clears throat> so if we're thinking about inspiration, we can think of a person in the Bible or in history or in the world today who inspires you. <clears throat> who is your most inspiring Bible character? Who is your most inspiring person in the world today? Think about who they are and how they've inspired you, what they're inspiring you to do. What else inspires you? Maybe how do you inspire other people? Now, interest is this, this funny emotion that's kind of hard to put a word to, but it's, it's having a hobby, a hobby where we lose um, our sense of time, we lose ourselves in what we're doing. We love doing it so much. We just get wrapped up in it. We don't notice how the time goes by. It can be running, it can be art, it can be reading or doing a jigsaw or whatever it is. We need to have an absorbing hobby that helps to fill our, our minds so that we're fully focused on what we're doing. And quite often women benefit because they are more likely to have a hobby that they can do at home than, than many men. But all, every one of us needs to have a good hobby. And we need to start helping our children and teenagers find good hobbies that are off screen, that intrigue them. My granddaughter's just got passionate about flowers and noticing the details in them and wanting to paint them and draw them. And, and she's so absorbed in that. And it's wonderful to see her off screen and being creative. <clears throat> so what are your favorite off screen hobbies? And what are the feelings, the positive emotions you have when you're involved in these hobbies? Often they can help us to feel peaceful, joyful, and um, maybe be filled with wonder, uh, feeling that we can do something well, which is another good experience. And what hobbies would you like to try that you haven't tried yet? Maybe you could have a go at them and, and see how much you enjoy them. <clears throat> so joy is a feeling of happy delight and freedom. It's different to laughter and amusement. It's that pure sense of abundant joy that comes and just bubbles out of us. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. And it's when we, we stand in that moment with God and say these rejoicing things, that we can feel that joy in our heart. Read a joyful psalm, read, sing a joyful song and, and experience the joy that comes with that. <clears throat> what was one of your happiest moments in the past week, the most joyful moment? What made it so happy? And if there's someone near you, tell them that. The, most, the happiest moment I had today was 
because when I am actually live with people and we share our happiest moments in the week, you can feel the joy in the room. You can see people's faces light up as they hear each other's stories, as they tell those stories. And that brings joy to the people around. And that's so powerful. So what do you do that brings joy to others? How do you experience joy? And, and, um, and focus on those joyful moments every day. You also need to have a healthy sense of purpose and value. That is feeling that what I do is valued by others and having satisfaction in a job well done. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Having a sense that I did a good job and people appreciated that. That is not pride. It is not bad. It's actually really good. We all need to feel that today we did something well. So what you can do is you can list three things you did well each day. This is so important for our well-being because often at the end of the day, if we're feeling negative or we've been overwhelmed by negative emotions, we will go to bed thinking of what we feel like are loads of things that we did wrong. Oh, I did this and I did this and I did this wrong. And I should have done that and oh, I regret this. And that doesn't help our well-being. So we need to list three things every day that we've done well. When we go to bed, tell our children what they've done well, think about what we've done well, and go to bed with a sense of, these are three things I did well. If you think about the things that didn't go so well, then just think, what did I learn from that experience? Reframe your mistakes as amazing learning opportunities um, and learn from them. Don't be overwhelmed by them. We're, not, we're human, we're never gonna do everything perfect, and we need to, be okay with good enough at times and let us let ourselves be in peace. Show that you value and appreciate others around you when they help you or when they do a good job. It's important, it's not building their pride, it's letting them know what they did was valuable. You say, I appreciated that, thank you for doing that. And that sort of thing can be enough. It doesn't make them feel proud, but they know that what they did made a difference to you. And that makes a difference to them when they feel they can make a difference. It gives them a sense of well-being. Then there's serenity, a feeling of peacefulness, stillness, calm and contentment. And we probably don't experience this as much as we need to because we rush from one thing to another. We fill every moment of the day with things to do and, and stuff. But we actually just need to be still and know that he is God and let the peace of God guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, as Paul says. So how do we find peace? Well, we need to find a space where we, we can be quiet and peaceful and where we can pray. You can try bubble breathing. Now this is breathing where um, you pretend you're blowing bubbles. So you take a deep breath in, and then you pretend to blow bubbles, especially big ones. And you blow out really slowly. Then you might imagine you're watching the bubbles wander away or blow real bubbles. It is such a good thing to do to calm yourself down and to find serenity. I discovered this when my children were little and I was a stressed out mum. And I went out into the garden just to clear my head and I picked up a pot of bubbles absent-mindedly and started to blow them. And as I did so, I really felt myself calm down very quickly. So now when I'm in an anxious situation or a stressful situation, I will do that bubble breathing. The deep breath in, slow breath out um, in a controlled manner and just experience the, the peace, the natural peace. It's a natural thing your body can do to calm it down. But other things can calm us down when we're stressed. We can take a drink of cool water and just sipping water and swallowing it can help us to feel calmer. We can smell lavender, citrus, baking bread. We can listen to soothing music. We can focus on the Bible verse. <clears throat> we can go for a walk in a quiet place. We can sit in the garden in the early morning and have our devotions. We all need a space where we can be quiet, we can be peaceful, and we can pray. And we need to help those around us have peaceful spaces too. Not fill our children's lives with busyness all the time, but just let them be still, maybe cuddle up with you, light a candle, listen to some quiet music, maybe read a Bible story together or a Bible verse and just really relax 
together and feel that peace of God in our hearts. Love is a blend of these positive emotions experienced within a warm, close, safe and caring relationship. So love is what happens when we, we laugh together, we share joy together, we share wonder together, we are creative together and we lose sense of time. All of these different things, when we do them together with someone else, then we can experience love. And God is love. We love because he first loved us. And we need to let his love soak into our lives to read the Bible verses like Psalm 103, Read about God's love. Let that soak into our heart and know I am his beloved child, his beloved daughter, his beloved son. God loves me and I love him because he loves me so much. And all of our love flows out of us experiencing God's love for us in the first place. So what helps you to feel especially loved? Well, Gary Chapman talked about the five love languages, which are having kind and loving words, being helped when you're doing something, having thoughtful gifts given to you, someone spending time with you, um, and physical affection, hugs, and so on. So what helps you to feel loved? And do you know what it is? And do you know what helps the people around you to feel loved so you can help them experience love too? Love is kindness. So sometimes we just think love is, well, that's about romantic relationships, but love is kind, says Paul. Being kind to others is really good for our emotional well-being. Whenever we're kind to others, we usually feel happier too. I think it's a blessing God has put in there that when we give to others, it boomerangs back to us in joy as well, and we feel happier. A psychologist told me that actually doing kind things for others, for many kinds of depression, many kinds, not all, um, being kind to others is a better therapy than, than counseling or medication. And God has given us that principle, be kind to others, do unto others as you'd have them do to you, because you'll be blessed by that experience. You notice other people that are in more difficult situations than yourself. You have the feel good factor, even just from thinking about um, planning something kind for other people. And so plan kindness, do kindness, live kindness out, and you will find it will add to your positive well-being. Why this matters is because when we, um, when we have positive thoughts, like Paul says, think about the positive things, when we choose positive emotions, all of these things are connected together. So when we think positive things, we will have positive emotions that will lead to positive behaviors that will help us to think positively about ourselves and others and so on. If we start to think negatively, it can negatively affect our emotions and our behavior and negative behaviors will affect our thoughts about ourselves, And so that becomes connected, but we need to choose which cycle we're going to be on. We're we going to be on a, a positive thinking, um, acting and feeling cycle or a negative one. And we can choose what we think about, we can choose to experience certain emotions when you know, the negative things will happen, we'll have a negative emotion, but then we can not just sit with that, but choose something positive to do to counterbalance it. And that's where we find the emotional balance. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of perspective, really. You know, we can focus on the dark and gloomy aspects of life. And there's many of those out there right now with the coronavirus and many other things that are happening. There's lots of things that can get us down. We, need to, we can often forget that there are many, many, many things, wonderful things happening around us every single day and to look, take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Now the dark bit that I showed in the previous picture was the very center of this garden right at the back there with the, the darker bushes. But if we step back, we can see, wow, actually there is so much wonder and joy to be experienced all around us. And we're missing it because we're just focusing on that tiny bit in the middle, instead of taking a step back and going, wow, God is amazing, this is still happening. We can look at the bigger picture and notice beauty and light and joy and kindness and love and hope around us. <clears throat> you know, on the, on the UK NHS website, I went there one time and I found these five ways to emotional well-being. Connect with others spiritually, emotionally and socially. Be active. Pay attention to the details of nature, life, beauty and relationships. 
give generously, keep learning and growing. And as I reflected on all of those, I realized that something amazing. And the something amazing that I realized was that these are all integral to our faith. They're all things that we do as Seventh-day Adventist church members. When we come to church on Sabbath or even on Zoom, we're connecting with others spiritually, emotionally, socially. We're encouraged to be healthy, to be active, to walk out in nature and to have healthy bodies. We are encouraged because we believe in God as the creator to notice the details of nature, life, beauty and relationships. We're encouraged to give generously and those that give more are happier than those that have more money, which is another principle of well-being. And to keep learning and growing and our church supports us in keep learning and growing. Children keep learning and growing. Sabbath school, adventurers, pathfinders, adults keep learning and growing through Sabbath school, through devotions, through listening to sermons and seminars. We can all keep learning and growing. And so around us, God has put things uh, around us in our spiritual community that help us to have emotional well-being when we follow through on them. And of course, much of Ellen White's writings also helps us to think about emotional well-being and connecting with others spiritually, being active, looking at nature and God's creation, being generous to others, and to keep on learning and growing. So what do you do? What do you do that will nurture your healthy and positive emotions? What are the things that you do um, because they help you to feel healthy and positive, have healthy emotions, they help your um, body to relax, they refresh you. What are the things that refresh you, lift you up, nurture you, uh, feed your soul, whatever it is that you like to um, describe it as? Make a list of those things. And actually it's quite useful to create um, a basket or a box or a place where you can put things that will help you to experience the positive emotions. So you might want to put in, a, create a playlist on your phone, a joyful worship music or peaceful worship music. You might want to collect some photographs that remind you of peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful experiences or joyful times. You might want to keep them, um, a book of like funny stories in there that help you to laugh and um, to, to nurture that aspect of your life. You might want to put things for a hobby in that basket or a book to read that inspires you. So if you gather together the things that help you to feel the positive emotions and put them in one place or create um, a basket for a, a child or a teenager that helps them to experience positive emotions and to engage with them, then you can just plonk down on the sofa when you've had a long day, pick up your basket, pull something out, uh, read a Bible verse, uh, listen to something, um, create something, have a giggle. All those things will help you to, to rebalance and you can intentionally choose to do those things. Just as Paul says, focus on thinking about these things. Be gentle to others, you know, be filled with peace when you think about God. Praise God for the good things and be thankful. So in our families and in our workplaces, we can let children and other people see how we manage our negative emotions and how we stay calm. Quite often, we don't talk to our children about what we do when we're frustrated or when we're stressed. And it's quite useful to explain to them what you do because they, that teaches them some skills. They can learn from you. So you might say, oh, I had this really stressful day at work. I went in and I had a big document to copy and when I went to the photocopy room, the copier wasn't working. And I was so stressed because I had like a 200 page document and what was I going to do? So I was really stressed and then I stopped and I thought about it. And I remembered that I have a friend in, a, in an office down the corridor who has her own um, copier in her room. And so I went down there and I, I asked her if I could copy the document and she let me. Whew, I felt so much better then. So you're helping children to see there's a frustration, you pause, you think about it, you think about the different solutions, you choose one, you maybe go and ask for help and your negative emotions will reduce. So it's very important that children learn from us how we deal with times when we, are, we feel guilty and how we resolve situations, um, when we've been shamed, how we help ourselves to feel um, dignity and honor again in different ways and do that for each other. And when we feel angry, how it might use, we might use that anger to do something positive if we're angry about an injustice 
or how we help ourselves or other people calm down when we feel angry? How do we feel, calm ourselves down when someone is rude to us in traffic or in a supermarket? What do we do? What do we think about to help us manage that? And tell your children what you do so that you can share your process with them because often that happens inside us and they don't know what's going on. And the more transparent we are about it, then the more they can learn from our example. It's very important that children and, well, all of us learn lots of words for our emotions to broaden our emotional vocabulary and the, especially the emotional vocabulary of children. Because the more words that we have to express what we're feeling, the easier it is for to communicate to someone else what's going on and to, to look for help and to invite their help. Even just being able to name it for myself. Oh, okay, I'm feeling that, that feels sad. Now, why am I sad? I'm sad because what can I do about it? I can go and seek comfort from so-and-so. I can tell them the story. I can ask them for a hug. So when we can identify what we're really feeling and help others identify what they're really feeling, that makes a huge difference. Um, otherwise, people can get very frustrated with their feelings. They get overwhelmed by feelings that they can't name. And because they can't name them, they don't know how to choose a healthy response to them. So it's really helpful to be able to, to name our emotions and encourage children. And if they're not sure, you can say, well, you know, it feels so sad when your little brother knocks your, knocks your tower down. It's so frustrating when you put all that work and effort into building something and then your little brother knocks it down. It's frustrating and it's sad. Um, but what can we do about that? Well, I know what we can do. I will take your brother to a, another room so that you have a safe space to build that tower again. So help them identify the emotions, help them to, to uh, redo what went wrong, to put it right. Um, if, the, if the child who knocked the tower down is old enough to help, well, involve them in the process um, so that you can help children to deal with their emotions. We can also listen for emotions in our friends' stories. They might tell us something that's happened. Someone comes home from work, said, I had a really bad day. And you can say, well, tell me more about that. Or your child comes home from school or a teenager, they've had a bad day. Listen to their story, listen for the feelings under there, respond well to them, reflect back what they're saying. So it sounds like you had a really rough day. Um, and you might, you know, if I were you, I'd probably feel a bit angry or a bit frustrated. Um, and it sounds as if you might be feeling this and this, and, and what can I do to help you? How can I help you to calm down or to relax or to, find some headspace, ask what you can do to help. Encourage others to find their own solutions. So rather than just going in there and fixing it, it's so easy. Someone comes with a sad story. This thing happened at school, at work, here or there. Oh, I don't know what you should do, you should just do this. And people need, first of all, for us to hear their feelings and respond to them and comfort them first, but then help them to think about the solutions they can find. Okay, so, Hmm. What did you try to make that better? Um, are there any other things that you think you could try? I wonder what other people do when they're in that situation. Well, let's pray about it. Let's see if there's something in the Bible that can help us. Let's have a look on the internet for some help. How do we fix this situation? And so encourage others to look for their own solutions, support children or teenagers or others in that process of exploring, as asking useful questions like, I wonder what would happen if, rather than, oh, you should just do this. And because that builds them the skills and the confidence that they can solve their problems. They know what to do. They know how to fix things for themselves. And that's very um, empowering. Helps them to build their confidence. It's also important to help people find positive activities that will absorb all their attention, like a jigsaw, books, crafts, sports, etc. Discover the things that really interest them and soothe them and bring them joy. One of our children got very interested in birds and we used to, uh, his dad would take him to listen to the dawn chorus. We got him some binoculars. He would find out about birds and he would just listen for them and recognize their songs. And we really supported him in their hobby that he developed for himself. Whatever our children were interested in, he nurtured that because the interests that they have, um, they can help to, they can look, in, look into those things. They can explore them when they need to rebalance their emotions. And also they can share their hobbies in ways that bless others too. Maybe they could teach um, 
uh, one of the honors for pathfinders or adventurers or make something with their hobby to give away and bless other people. Grow food in the garden to share, make bread to give away, um, knit scarves for cold people, homeless people. So use the hobby to bless others because when we're using our interest, it's giving us joy and we're being kind as well. That's multiple positive experiences in one activity. And so we're triply blessed or maybe even quadruply blessed by some of the things that we can do. It's really important to laugh in life and children laugh way more than adults do. We get quite somber and we need to learn to laugh again. But actually we find out that when you want to teach someone something, a child or an adult, if they laugh, it opens up their mind like, like a big, like a big, I don't know, a big space where there's, they can learn. It's like there's a big sponge that can absorb new information. But if they're not laughing, if they're feeling stressful or frustrated, then it's like everything closes down and it's hard to get new information into that space. So laughter opens up the mind and helps them to learn better. So be a positive role model. You know, we need to live our lives filled with positive emotions, such as joyfulness and gratitude. And I believe Jesus as he lived his life and Paul as he lived his, they went through life as positive role models, managing their emotions under very difficult circumstances, blessing others even when they're in challenging situations, even when they were close to death. Um, and so when we, we can be a good role model, living our life with positive emotions that will spill onto the people around us and affect them. Because you know, when we're joyful and peaceful and grateful, that's infectious. Our children, the young people around us, our friends, our colleagues, our family members will catch some of that and it will spill onto them and their well-being is enhanced. It only takes one person in a family, in a workplace, in a situation to, to um, give up, experience lots of negative emotions and express them all the time to spoil things for everybody else, spoil everyone else's peace and joy. So well, one person is positive, it can also have an effect on everybody and lift them up. So as I mentioned before, what went well at the end of every day, list three things that went well, focus on them, help other people to think about what they did well too. Um, and, and tell them today, these things went well, you did this well. Tell your child what you noticed they did well. So they go to bed feeling good about themselves rather than anxious and afraid and alone. Help other people to find a place where they can be quiet and peaceful and pray and think happy and healthy thoughts. Maybe you want to journal and, uh, and have spiritual journaling, grow their own relationship with God, you know, because the closer we come to God, the more he will help us find um, the peace, the quiet, the, the positive emotions, and he can teach us how to experience them more. And we can use them in our faith and spirituality to add to our our joy, our gratitude, our peacefulness, they all kind of go together well. So find simple ways to fill your life with as many positive emotions as possible. You might think, well, that's a lot of hard work, all of these positive emotions. But it takes me maybe 15 minutes to come home on the bus from my work to my home, 15, 20 maximum. And I can get on the bus and I look out the window, I thank God for the things I can see. I look for something to fill me with wonder. I look at something that will give me peace or maybe do some slow breathing or I'll be still and know that I am God. I really love that verse. It really helps me to feel calm. Or maybe I might look up my phone and see something funny that someone has sent me. And by the time I get home, I've experienced lots of little bits of positive emotion. Um, or I can just go with gratitude for the whole 20 minutes. And it helps to reset my mind. So I come back into the house with positive emotions to share and to help bring sunshine into the house. Ellen White talks about this. She talks about the, the father, particularly who might be working outside of the home to bring back into the home positive emotions to bring sunshine with him when the, the wife has been at home and they're managing the children and doing all of her work that she needs him to come in with, with the joy and the sunshine to encourage her and to um, bring joy in for the children as well. So we can choose to create that space to rebalance our emotions when we've had 
a lot of negative emotions. Choose these positive things, laugh, wonder, be kind, be playful, be inspired, focus on the positive and believe the best. Now, as a family therapist, I sometimes work with uh, well, families, <laughs> obviously, and um, emotional pies in a way that I use to help people express their emotions, maybe even to guess what other people in their family are feeling. And it's a way to kind of get a bit of an insight into what's going on in the people around you. So once a week, you can just say, let's draw our emotional pie this week and see where we're at today right now. And put in there how much, uh, this one says stressed, confused, happy, hurt, whatever emotions in there. How much of them did you experience? Now, small children can't really do the pie chart thing very well, but older children can actually you know, show the proportion of the feelings in their life. And then you say, when you're experiencing that, um, when are you most likely to feel that? When I feel this emotion, I might show it by doing this. And when I feel this, I need other people to do this to help me. So these are the ways to talk about your emotional pie. When are you most likely to feel the feeling? And it can be happy things as well as um, challenging emotions, um, can be the positive ones. When I feel this emotion, I show it by doing this and this is what I need other people to do. And I did this with one girl and she did all of her emotions. And then there was one part of the pie and she said, this slice here are all the feelings I don't have words for yet. And I thought that was so mature. She could recognize that she had feelings that she didn't have words for and that were beyond her understanding. And she made some space for those. And then she said, a pie, a pie has a lid. So this is what I'm feeling inside. This is the content of the pie. And her pie was maybe 80% negative emotions and 20% positive. But she said, this is the lid of my pie. And it was 80% positive and 20% negative because she was hiding her emotions and pretending to be positive on the outside, but really hurting underneath. So we need to be aware that sometimes people may seem very positive, but actually they can be hiding a lot of difficult emotions underneath because they're not sure if you'll understand, they're not sure if you'll listen, they're not sure if you will shame them if you, if you know about their feelings. So we need to help people feel safe to talk about their feelings, to connect with them, to really listen and to ask what we can do to help. So I wonder, as I've gone through this, I wonder what you've just learned, what new ideas interested you the most and what will you do this week to help you experience more of the positive emotions that will give you an abundant life, an abundant life with Jesus today. So I hope that what I shared will, will help you find some ideas, some things that you can do to rebalance your emotions, to choose things that will support your positive, emotional and spiritual well-being, and that uh, you'll be able to share those with others and inspire them too. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've created us amazingly and you've created us with this capacity to feel a wide range of emotions. And in this broken world, we can often feel the negative emotions that drain us. But thank you that you have given us so many opportunities to experience positive emotions. And sometimes it's really tough when we feel overwhelmed, but help us to, to hold on to these positive emotions, to choose to be grateful to you, to be filled with wonder for you, to praise you, no matter what is happening, because you are doing something amazing behind the scenes. Help us to reach out and hold your hand and trust you through whatever we're experiencing right now and help us shine the light into our lives to help us experience more of these positive emotions that help us live the abundant life that Jesus came to give us through Jesus' name. Amen.